we are live. Welcome to Moon Knight Episode 2 Thoughts. This episode is called Summon the Suit. I really love seeing Ethan Hawke playing this more sinister uh, character. I love him playing heroes as well, but this is so unusual, at least for the roles I see him in, and he does so well at it. It's cool to see his range. And I, I don't think I did enough to sing the praises of Abraham last episode. He's incredibly talented. I've heard a lot of people say, F. Murray Abraham, and I'm like, calm down. What did Murray Abraham ever do to you? Stephen wakes up, tries to figure out if it was a dream or if Mark is real. Enters the museum, the camera's upside down, as this world now is. I had forgotten, technically, there is a shot very similar to that in the first episode, but that one used like a, I want to say, a puddle reflection. That I think that's why I didn't connect the two. What you're about to see is going to melt your brain. Okay, it's like Area 51 NI6 bonkers. And, yeah, I had guessed that, it's, you know, somehow... The, the camera was not going to show. Yeah. Are you crying when I'm at you? So cameras and mirrors don't show jackals, don't show moon's night. Well, that's it. I got sacked. They were like, I have to let you go. And I'm like, oh, thank goodness. I thought I was getting sacked. I, I know. It's, it's too obvious. You know, sometimes you got to do the obvious joke. And Steven hugs the human statue who breaks character just a little bit to stare at him. And Steven finally finds the right storage locker. Finds the scarab. You know, Crack pointed out, how can he tell that it's not pointing north, though? He's inside a storage locker. And it's like, yeah. In, in, actually, yeah. Uh, if, you ha if you aren't already, watch the, the Cracked... You know, he'll like, he, he's made a video on each episode so far. He'll explain the plot of the episode and point out little things that are like, hey, yeah. Well. I love the bit with the light coming on and off as Khonshu gets closer. Brief spoiler for Morbius. There's a similar scene in Morbius, and while it's great, it's nowhere near as effective as this. No more spoilers. For Morbius for the rest of this video. I quite like the scenes with Layla and Steven and she legitimately seems to not know about Steven at all and I quite like how like at first she's like I don't know what you're doing please stop look we can get the divorce you want it's fine you know I wish you didn't just leave me hanging I've been really worried about you but she really does not believe Stephen when he says that he's not Mark. But then when he gives her the scare, you know, I, I, I really appreciate when characters are written to be as smart as they are supposed to be. When she, when he just hands over the scarab, she's like, "Okay, this is different. This is not something Mark would just do." So there must really be something to this Steven thing. You know, that's why she shows up later with the Scarab. She realizes that, you know, she's like, okay, Mark is going to be fine, but this is Steven, and he really does not seem to have any idea what's going on. He can't defend himself. So she, you know, she brings the Scarab to distract them and then tries to, you know, basically remind him that he's Mark, that Mark is in there. Get away from the back. Don't show her what's in the back. You're going to kill her. Don't show her the scare over. You're responsible for who comes after that. I, I like how at first Steven's like, yeah, yeah, yada, yada, yada. It's, I'm starting to get used to this whole voice in my head thing who's constantly telling me I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. But then here's the, the and, and insulting me, you know, but then it's like he does not want to get her hurt. And she recognizes the scare on sight. And the cops come in and she climbed onto the outside of the building, born identity style, very cool. And I like that, like, when when Steven was alone in the cop car, you know, they, they he he's talking like he really doesn't expect anybody to be listening to, you know, he doesn't expect Arthur to be listening to him. 
So, you know, Arthur knew that. Arthur knew that this was a way to get information out of him because in the first episode, he kind of tried just asking. You know, he's, he's not like... He doesn't direct. He doesn't jump directly to violence. So he just he tried asking, but it didn't really get results. Then he sent a monster. You know, he sent a jackal after him. That didn't work. So now he tries leaving him alone, handcuffed, and and just listening to what he says when he doesn't think anyone can hear him. And Arthur sounds legitimately sympathetic to Stephen. And the twist that Arthur used to be. The Avatar, that's really, really cool. That is super interesting. Like, it really complicates matters. He is no longer just... Uh, you know what? Actually, he was never just a one-note bad guy in this entire show. Like, in, in the first episode, he was also interesting. There's, there's shades of gray. And Arthur expresses wanting to free Ahmed, which which means you know he's going to kill kill a lot of people who will be guilty in the future. I only punish those who have already done real harm. I am real justice. So it really is a conflict between punishment after the crime and pre-crime. And Stephen brings up thought crime, children who might do evil when they become adults. And I really appreciate like. When he says that, like, Arthur doesn't, like, he doesn't deny it, and he also doesn't seem, like, shocked at the idea, but he has, like, this nice detached metaphor for it, you know. It's like amputation, you know. It might seem extreme, but if you don't do it, you know, it's just, yeah, he's he, he really makes a really good, like, really compelling ah, cult leader. Because you, you can understand why people would, but, you know, at first people might be like, child murder, but then, oh, it's amputation, I mean, oh, that does make sense. Where is the scarab? I have it. Well, can I has it? Summon the soup. And they make a run for it. Layla kicks some ass. Purple light releases another jackal. It's very sweet that Lila came to rescue Mark, and I really appreciate a story where the female character is rescuing the male character. Trying to rescue him by getting him to remember who he is. Layla can't see the jackal. She must not be watching corrections. I really like referring to Mr. Knight as Psycho Colonel Sanders. I'm really glad that they did fit in Mr. Knight in addition to Moon Knight. And he pulls off a perfect superhero landing. And Layla helped with the jackal by attacking where she realizes it must be, even though she can't see it. Very cool. And they reenact the cover of Quarantine together. And Stephen punches the jackal, but it also hits back. I I quite like the you know apparently some people hated you know the the ponderer describes it as you know, just, what was it, giga cringe or something like that. I, he, he did a really great breakdown of, of the scene, the, the um, Stephen punching the, the jackal as Mr. Knight. I, I couldn't quite put words to it the way he could, but yeah, I, I just loved it. But I loved it for the reasons that he explains, especially when he goes into, like, self-actualizing. It's Yeah. He's just a fancy drunk. That was a hell of a punch back there. And Steven lets Mark and thus Moon Knight take over. Really cool with the invisible entity in the fight causing damage, but we can only see the damage itself. Like when it steps on the car windshield, like there's a clip like crack and, and, and you can kind of see, okay, that has to have been a paw. You know, that wasn't like a fist punching or or you know, some kind of yeah. And Moon Knight impales the jackal and then catches the moonerang. Badass. I'm sorry, but that belongs to me. I can offer you food, clothing, but that belongs to me. I wish you could see the world we're making. He does sound legitimately empathetic. So many people would just scream at the unhoused man. 
and now Steven is the one only seen in mirrors. Mark in his, is in full control of the body. I quite like this. I, I really appreciate that they didn't just do the same thing as the first episode. In the first episode, basically only at the very end did we see Mark. Up until that, we only saw things from Steven's perspective. So when Mark takes over, Steven blacks out. And we just see what was there right before and what's there right after. And in this one, we properly see you know, and this idea that, yeah, you know, Stephen now trapped in the mirrors, that's legitimately horrifying. Oscar Isaac is incredibly talented. It's such a huge difference between Mark and Stephen in body language and how they talk. And the Moon God threatens Mark that if he fails, Layla will be the next, that if he fails, comma, Layla will be the next Avatar. I really appreciate that they include that the Moon God is antagonistic with Mark, at least some of the time. It's not just that he gets these cool powers, there is a cost. And he wakes up in Egypt, end credits, rapping in, I don't know, Egyptian. So in the first episode, we saw a jackal, but we didn't quite see the summoning of one, I'm almost certain, but we did here. Now, IGN expressed frustration at this episode, having as much as it does of Steven confused. I can see what they mean. I'm... I'm glad that they toned it down as much as they did do. And I like the Moon God is petty. You know, he claims to be all about justice, but he manipulates Mark, pressures him by telling if he fails, little the next avatar. I'm never going to sleep again. That's just what Freddy wants you to think. So by the end of this episode, we do not know what it is that has made the suppressed identity stronger, as Mark tells Stephen has happened, and didn't used to be the case. Mark didn't really used to have any trouble keeping keeping Stephen suppressed when Mark is out on missions, but now Stephen wakes up during Mark's missions, and this episode even manages to keep Mark from taking control again. You know, I, I suppose there were times where Mark had trouble getting control again in the first episode. But most of the time, he didn't really realize that he was actively doing that. But in this one, he is actively doing it. In, in this, you know, Mark only gets control back at the end of this episode when Steven intentionally lets him, other than the end of the previous episode. Even though he managed to, through force of will, the first episode on multiple occasions. The fact that the magic that summons the jackal is purple is described by some of the Easter egg YouTubers as being significant. It's the color of the magic of Agatha Harkness, the Dark Dimension, the Power Stone, and Vibranium. I do hope that next time Arthur needs something impressive and supernatural, it's not a third jackal. Let's be honest, there only needed to be one jackal movie, period. Now, one of the biggest mysteries of the first episode was what's the deal with the Scarab? And, you know, why does Arthur want it? Why does Mark want to keep it from Arthur? This episode answers that and leaves leads very nicely into the next part of the story. Now that Arthur has it, Moon Knight has to try to come up on top despite that. And that's also great. Like, if this episode had ended with Mark still having the, the Scarab, it wouldn't be anywhere near as, you know, compelling. Like, now we really, like, we know if he, if he manages to, let's see, awaken, no, wait, release Ahmed, then she's gonna, like, he's, he's doing it one at a time, but Ahmed is not gonna have that kind of limitation of, of killing a bunch of people who in the future will be guilty. I suppose maybe some of them have already done something, but certainly there will be a chunk of them who haven't yet. Now that Steven has been fired, nobody remembers his name. I guess that makes him F X gift shopist so and so. Yeah, I I know, but I still like Sinister Two, and love Sinister One. Now, some people wish the character was closer to the comic. I think Feige and Co were worried that they would end up with something too similar to Batman. Let's be honest, if, you know, for for casual viewers, they're not, like, if they hear, oh, Moon Knight is basically Batman, they're probably not going to watch Moon Knight. They're, they're going to be like, well, it's not going to top the Batman. And, I mean, I love this show, but, yeah, the, the Batman, the movie, 
holy crap, that was amazing. So, yeah, I, th I think it makes a lot of sense to lean into the stuff that makes the two characters extremely different. So, going with this kind of supernatural, like, the supernatural powers. Like, as far as I understand, like, in the comics, at least a, a bit of the time, the, the Moon Knight suit is a, a suit, like, the, the way that the bat, the bat, uh, bat suit is a suit, you know, it's, it's a, it's maybe armor, but it's, it's made from, it, you know, people sat down and made it, it's not magic, and, yeah, I, I really appreciate that they instead went for this supernatural thing. I suppose I should say, I don't think I've read any Moon Knight, so I, it's possible that I would be, that I would not feel this way if I had. But, yeah, that's it for this episode. Extremely excited to see what's in the next one, so I'll catch you then.